Nation, where we talk about news, we talk about culture, and where we admit that we didn't even try to see Taylor Swift this summer. I just didn't even try. I am your host, Nikki Farsad. I didn't click one thing for one second to try to get those tickets. I didn't try and make a connection to some person that's connected to a thing and a venue. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't try any. I didn't have a conversation about trying. I did not try. Um, and I don't know this might, and I just want to be honest with everyone about it. And I don't, this might mean that my passport gets revoked. I'm not sure what the consequences are of this vulnerability that I'm now sharing. Um, but I just felt like every, we should all be on the same page and we should all know today. We're not going to talk about that, but we are going to talk about how to cancel plans. We're also going to talk about the really dumb impeachment plan uh, that should also be canceled, actually. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about how America is getting really old and that no amount of Botox is going to help the actual underlying problem. Um, I am so excited by today's panel. Turns out these two folks have worked together before, um, which is always nice when that happens. Uh, we have joining us... Um, for the millionth time, is a host of the longest running news pod. Um, it's called The Gist. I've been on The Gist. The Gist is so phenomenal. I don't even know how he does it um, because he's been doing it for so long. And the frequency is, I want to say, daily. Is it daily? It might be. Yes, it's daily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I, don't, it's, I don't want to say daily, but I have to. But it is. I yeah, it's know. daily. It's wild. It's so much information in this because this man is so smart. I've also had the honor of working with him on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me because he's so fucking hilarious and great at all times it is the wonderful mike pesca thanks nagin i want you to know i gave all my taylor swift money towards jet season tickets anticipating <laughs> nice, a great nice. season which will not happen <laughs> um and i am also joined uh for the first time uh we're so excited to have her on She's host of Times Person of the Week podcast, which you should uh, obviously be subscribing to. Um, she is the wonderful, the jubilant. And also, by the way, before we started talking, Mike was just like really um, hard recommending one of her pieces from the 2020 election. Um, so she's a tremendous writer, but again, host of Times Person of the Week podcast, Charlotte Alter. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, and I also didn't try to get Taylor Swift tickets, but then I had like a 15 year old girl meltdown about it where I was like, everybody's going with me. And so I'm not as cool about not going to Taylor Swift as you are. Well, I, I once I've heard, of, especially heard about the movie, I was kind of like, well, we're all going to be taken care of at the end of the day if we need to be taken care of in an era's way. You know what I mean? It'll be fine for everybody involved. Um, all I don't right. know. That's, that's how I saw Hamilton. And did I really see Hamilton just via the movie? Oh, right. It's like yeah, the I pale see. imitation I of but it, but it, But I sort of, okay, so my other dirty secret. Oh my God, today's show is all about me like revealing my darkest <laughs> truths. My other darkest truth is that I've never seen Hamlet. Um, I aspire to see Ham uh, Hamlet, Hamilton, Hamilton. <laughs> I have I have seen Hamlet, unfortunately. Um, no, but I've Hamilton never seen Hamilton. Way better. Um, That's right. Hamlet, yeah, like a Hamlet little bit more. Hamlet did throw away his job. <laughs> Ham Hamlet's a skip. You could say hey, hey, Hamlet, I have some fucking notes, Shakespeare. Come on. Uh, no, but but Hamilton, I never saw. And it's it was one of those things where like at the peak of Hamilton, which lasted like two fucking years, I just like didn't want to be in the getting tickets game. Like anything where you have to try really hard to get tickets, I can't do it. And um, and so I didn't get it. And then then it, now it's easier to get tickets. And I just it, now it's just like on, on a to do list. You know what I mean? Like I just like need to get it done. And fucking I I also I finally saw Oppenheimer. I don't know if you can read that in my demeanor, um, but I finally I finally <laughs> saw. Oppenheimer and um and I wanted did you guys see Oppenheimer I did I was like a little I was like what is Robert Downey Jr. doing in this movie this this whole like bureaucratic subplot is so boring it, um, it felt a little yeah yeah I, it on. I loved it, I, it I saw I saw it in IMAX. I thought Cillian Murphy's pores uh, deserve the best acting. Oh That's how God. big the yeah. picture yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Like we got nostrils. We got hairs yes. on the ear. But I, I, <laughs> I loved it. And I also love the fact when you think about it, the flashbacks, the further back they went were in color and the more recent ones were in black and white. So that and the A-bomb are two things that blew my mind. Wow, I didn't even noticed that until you didn't you notice it. it no i was like 
That's how know. they were like helping us keep track. Oh wait, no. Okay, I knew that the Robert Downey Jr. parts were in black and white, but I think I was just so I was so irritated by it. Yeah. I was just like, why are we hearing about this? Like, it felt like a weird kind of culture war, like knock you over the head with like people are judged by different standards of right. the times they live in. Like, it yeah. felt like a sort of like beat you over the head cultural commentary thing, and I just wanted more about the Manhattan Project. Well, and I will say. So uh, so it's a three hour long movie. I the middle two hours are stressful as fuck. Like I literally had to go take a break. I told my friend like, um, yeah, I like have to go to the bathroom. I totally have to go to the bathroom. Like I didn't really have to go to the bathroom. I just like literally need to like take a little stroll, <laughs> get some peanut M&Ms, take a breather. <laughs> like I could. And I went to the to the um the woman at the concession stand and I was just like, this movie is really fucking stressful <laughs> and I needed a break. And she was just laughing. She's like, I've, I've been working here like it, for months and I can't, haven't seen it yet because I feel like it's too stressful for me. And I, and you're now verifying that it's too stressful for me. I shouldn't see it. Like, and I was like, yeah, maybe sit this one out. <laughs> so str- even though I fucking know how it turns out, right? Like it's, we know, we know that story. Uh, anyway, Folks, um, let me know. Did you see Oppenheimer? We weren't planning on talking about it. Let's get into topic number one. While I wouldn't quite say it's trendy to opt out and stay in, the tweets, t-shirts, mugs, and art aren't exactly discouraging this behavior either. Says an article that we read on canceling plan and self canceling plans and self.com. Um now, do you feel now again like I, I would almost say trendy is what I would call it. Do you feel like canceling plan plans is happening more or less or the same as before? And by before, I mean before the pandemic or before 2010 when the internet exploded or, you know, I don't know, some kind of amorphous before. Well, it's not, it's not happening as much as, I mean, it is happening a lot more than during the pandemic because there were no plans to cancel. That article that you sent around is from Self Magazine, and the subhead is, opinion, if you have a packed calendar and a pressing need for to practice <laughs> self-care, this one's for you. And I was thinking a lot about the phrase self-care. Can we just take the care part and replace it with ish? Selfish. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't most of what's called self-care just being selfish? And out of curiosity, I did a control F. The number of times the word self comes in this self magazine article, and you know, granted, <laughs> it's going to come on the title, is 31 times. That's way too much obsession with the self. It can be rude depending on how you do it, but I don't know if it's a trend, unless this is the whole thing about cancel culture that they're prattling on about, and I just missed the point. <laughs> I don't so, know. I mean, so okay, so I have to I'm coming at this from somebody who is an introvert who is really good at pretending to be an outro uh, an extrovert. So like people meet me and I'm not shy and I you know, and I'm a professional reporter, so I go up and ask people questions and they think that I'm an extrovert, but actually I'm an introvert. And for me, I think this whole question of like are we overscheduled? Is it can you cancel plans? Is it rude? is really more of a symptom of like plans, making a plan with somebody is like too baked into our social like niceties kind of. Like there should be a way to see somebody and be like, or to like run into somebody or to email with them or whatever, like to see somebody in in some context and be like, hey, so great to see you. Like would love, you know, like love to, you know, love to have you in my life. You're a wonderful person. And to not have that interaction end with making another plan. Like for me, I feel like we're all so overscheduled because we don't have a way to say like, hello, person in my life. Um, I care about you. I wish you the best. I, li- I like you a lot. I don't want to make a plan with you. Like, I don't want to do it next week. I don't want to do it three weeks from now. I don't want to do it in November. I want to continue to have a nice, friendly relationship with you and not have a plan on the books. And that is <laughs> how do you <laughs> how do you maintain a nice, friendly relationship with someone when you don't like see them? Because there is because I think what happens with adulthood, like I think that's what's what's marvelous about being in school and being in college 
is that you naturally see people. There isn't very much plan making at all. It's just like happening. Your friendships are just happening and they're happening around you all the time. And then the minute you become an adult, that those like naturally occurring friendships, you know, need to be scheduled. And it's like, so then what do you do? Well, so, but that's what I would kind of push back on is that I feel like I have friendships, particularly with people who like live far away or something where it's like, we just text a lot. And it's not, or like, we're like always in each other's Instagrams or whatever. And it's, and like, I still think that we're friends, but it's not so much like, can you do Thursday the 19th? No, I can't. Can you do six months from now? Sure. Like, it's not like, I'm so. How's never? Of... Does never work for you? <laughs> right. Like, I, I wish that there was a polite way to say, I love you. I care about you. I do not want to calendarize this relationship. I did that. I actually pulled that off. How? Uh, I, what my, is the language? Please tell me. <laughs> well, uh, I think you may it may be uh, helpful to be men of 50, which weren't raised in an emotional culture at all. But my right. friend Jeremy Gittler and I would run into each other every so often. And at, we'd always have a good time. And then we'd say, hey, that was great. You know what? Let's just run into each other some other time. So one of us, I forgot which one, had to actually broach the subject as a plan. You have to make the plan not to have a plan. Like, hey, how about this? Let's just know that every once in a while, because we have mutual friends, we're going to run into each other and enjoy that. And he said, that's a great idea. Now, I haven't seen Jeremy in about 12 years, so I don't know how well it's working out. No, but seriously, <laughs> you can do this. It's just very hard. Do you know about the Dunbar number? Do you guys know what that is? No. Oh, the number of that? friends? Yeah. Is that the so number this, of friends? I think sociologist researcher said, about 150 people is how many human beings can really deal with and conceptualize as real people. And then they become abstractions. And he figures this out by looking at all uh, throughout history and culture. And I do think that's true. I think anything more than 150, it just becomes a name or a slot on a calendar. And unless you plan not to have a plan, you're going to run into oftentimes more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. One, I, one of the things yeah. that I enjoyed about... Um, no, so I, I'm not a canceler. I mean, I think that the other thing is like so m everyone is sort of like just uh, a little depressed. <laughs> yeah. And my feeling is if they saw more of their friends, they would be less depressed. But then those are also the same people that cancel. So mm. so I, I just want to say in defense of making a plan and not canceling, uh, it is better for your mental health if you see people and you will generally feel better after you see a person than what you felt like when you went into that occasion. So I feel like that's one thing. Also, I think just we're all, to, I think you're the way you started out, Mike, is correct. I think we're all together and listeners have heard me say this before, too focused on how we feel and our own comfort and our own convenience and our own this and our own that. And it's so everything yeah. is about like, again, what can I do for me and like right. deliver to my door and like, don't make me walk to a thing. And like, it's just like, right. oh, everything will atrophy your brain, your body, your heart, everything will atrophy. If you continue at that pace, uh, do not totally be so obsessed agree. with yourself. And we have this whole apparatus of solipsism that excuses mm -hmm. it and invents words and phrases to tell you that this is the right thing to do and the never and the agoraphobic pajama lifestyle is self-care you know it's not stop sometimes it can be there are gradations and gray areas but man are the excuses so easy or the phrases and the uh the cognitive off ramp so easy to grasp for and just to tell you oh it's all okay no you're actually being a selfish person Okay, so here's what I think it is for me. For me, I think okay. it's less about it's less about wanting to like stay in and be in my PJs and watch TV alone. And more that I and I think maybe this is something that I'm like clinging to from college, or also maybe this is something because I have like a toddler and like so much of my life is so like regimented around that. Mm -hmm. Like for me, the possibility of spontaneity is super important. Like nothing is more depressing to me than it being like Friday at 4 p.m. and I'm looking ahead to my weekend and I'm like, I have a thing Friday night and then Saturday morning this and then Saturday lunch that and then Saturday afternoon that and that like, you know, and having like every block of my weekend or my yeah. like free yeah. time kind of like spoken for. So for me, it's not that it's like, like 
for me, it's not that I don't want to see people. It's that there is a psychological difference to me between seeing a friend who it's been on the calendar for two and a half months and I've been staring it down and I'm like, oh God, like, like this is now I got to go do this versus if a friend texts me that morning and said, hey, do you want to go check out this thing at the museum? Like, I would love to do that. And so for me, it's about like preserving, doing that exact same thing with that exact same friend, but doing it in a way that feels spontaneous rather than well, like, and also I think it, yeah. you're m- probably more likely to get that person, uh, that person's like true availability, like emotional, mental, and actual availability. Um, yeah. And so, it, and this is something, one of the final tips actually in the piece, which is what I like the most about the t- piece was um, it said one final tip, embrace quasi spontaneous plans, which is exactly what you're talking about, yeah. um, which is, and, and, and these are, these are ones, you know, we ended up doing like a trip to upstate New York to see friends that was like arranged within a couple of days, which is the kind of thing that usually ends up being like weeks in advance and da da da. And there's which a car so and there's fun. this and there's that. And it was so fun and just the idea that we all happen to be free was amazing you know um and so that's like those are i think also with parenthood um i i end up having to embrace the quasi spontaneous plan more because it's just like there is so much that my that i have to like run around and do for my daughter like you know but there are nights that i have free or whatever and i'm a comedian so that's like annoying it kind of cuts out a lot and i also have to keep a lot of nights open for being a comedian so it's just like the quasi spontaneous plan ends up being some like a little bit of my saving grace personally yeah Yeah. that's that's where i land as like that's like that's the kind of plan that i want like i want a plan that is planned within like 72 hours of Of a thing thing. yeah i the the kinds of plans that i hate that i end up canceling are the ones where it's like we've all gotten our calendars together and we've decided that like 14 weeks from now, we will have a glass of wine at a bar. Like nothing could be less fun to me than (laughs) that. that. Right. (laughs) Mike, any final thoughts on this? Yes. One is I don't actually think Charlotte is an extrovert. I think she's given us a, a, sorry, I don't think she's an introvert. I think she has uh, so many extroverts or quasi extroverts say, but I'm really an introvert. Charlotte, in social situations, do you lose energy or gain energy? lose energy really? okay <laughs> really? i'm saying that because i know the definition of an introvert <laughs> yeah you know the right answer You're, what you are is a good student who is so i do think that yeah there's a lot of uh there's a lot of time that we're put upon by being in situations we don't want to be in but i think you might be more of an extrovert it's the obligation anything it's the, that obligation. Put, it's the yeah. obligation it's the bromitment and once that's on the schedule that becomes a looming thing rather than, you know, it's probably working on different synapses in your brain where yeah. it rests a different pleasure center. And when it becomes, it becomes just, it stops living as uh, two hours you're going to spend together with a friend and starts living as this thing I have to do four weeks from Sunday. So yeah, it stops it, becoming a friendship interaction and it starts becoming this, you know, oppressive obligation. So that's why maybe yes. the, the three day, quasi spontaneity doesn't allow itself to fester in that manner exactly and it's also like another thing to be on time for which is the other reason i don't do workout classes because it's like another thing to be on time for (laughs) (laughs) all right folks let me know what you think by the way i do i like the term uh introvert and outrovert so uh, (laughs) i would like for us all as a country to adopt the the term outrovert um, let us uh, move on. We were we're going to hear actually a, a quick note about our sponsors who keep the lights on here at Fake the Nation. And when we come back, we'll continue our chatter. And we are back. And let us uh, step into topic number two. All right. We're going to talk about the Biden impeachment. It's been simmering in the background since Biden took office, but it was always stupid. It's still stupid. But it gained traction yesterday because Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who's the kind of speaker who every day has to worry about being ousted from being a speaker, he is now supporting a formal impeachment inquiry saying that there is real evidence. Now, if you're like the average person, you're probably wondering what evidence. Also, what is any of this about? Because it's 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 been kind of and I, I wonder how it's landed in your ears. I mean, you're both, you know, uh, serious people. 
um, who read the news and know the news and report on the news. So this may be different to you, but I feel like for the average person, like if I mention it to my mom, she'll be like, what, what impeachment, what did he do? You know, why, why is he, why impeachment inquiry? So like, how kind of like, is how has this landed in your uh on your radar? Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I mean, there's he does not have the goods. There is no evidence, no hard evidence to support an impeachment of President Biden right now. To me, uh to me, this is um an attempt by the GOP to essentially create what is their most powerful political, create more of what is their most powerful political substance, which is whataboutism. Like they just want any any bad thing that you can say about the Republican party circa 2023, which is, which there are many bad things to say. Um, they, they are politically invested in making it so in muddying the waters so that the American people believe those same things about the Republican Party. So it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that this is happening after months of Donald Trump being indicted for various crimes, you know? So this helps them to make an argument to very exhausted and confused American voters that like, both sides are bad, both sides are terrible. You know, uh, Trump's been indicted, Biden's been impeached, everybody's a liar, everybody sucks, because that helps them to uh, sort of excuse what's happening in their own house, basically. Mike Pesca. Can you imagine being Kevin McCarthy? Can you imagine having 222 colleagues, actually 221, that's how many, there are 222 Republicans, and at any moment, you can't have more than four of them be upset with you. Because if you have four of them saying, I don't like this person anymore, your job, the one that you've been wanting your whole life may be over. And also, let me add to that, that of these more than four people can't be upset with you, one is Matt Gates, one <laughs> is Lauren Boebert, <laughs> one is, right? There's a, there's a few wild cards in that mix. So in general, Charlotte is right. Now, I would say to Gene, your mom says what is impeachment, although why is she sounding like a Jewish lady? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but would she say what? Like the what? That's what? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The Iranians um, will do a little V on there. There is a there is a Persian Jewish overlap, I find. Yeah, yeah indeed. Air kinkiness, other areas. Yes, yes. But, but if you're in a certain circle of America, you're like, oh my God, thank God it's time for impeachment. I can't believe the Biden crime family has been getting off scot-free thus far. Now, the problem is that circle of society is unrepresentative of the average voter and even the persuadable voter. And McCarthy, and I think Mitch McConnell knows this, and McCarthy must know this, that deep down, the people within his party who are clamoring for impeachment might be so beholden to the part of America that just knows all the narratives of Burisma and Victor Shokin and every little detail of when uh, Hunter Biden was on the phone and received what diamond from what Chinese billionaire, all things that, by the way, happened. Um, they're so enamored and entrenched in that world, they cannot see that this will blow back to them. I I'm not 100% pr predicting it will, but it is a huge danger. It is a huge danger that the Republicans use their political capital to pursue this impeachment that will either register as nothing because uh, they come up with nothing or will register as a giant waste of time going against a father who just loves his son with substance abuse issues. So there is this danger in that that I think McCarthy knows, but I do think the members of his caucus who are clamoring for the impeachment, they may, may be living in such a different world, they don't see how it's going to play to the American people. But I will say that I do think there are more answers that I, as a curious American, would like to know. I haven't come to conclusions yet. I think there is no evidence that I've seen that Joe Biden personally benefited from anything that Hunter did. I think that there is just very weak and tendentious evidence that says that Joe Biden, you know, influenced politics or the American agenda in any way just for Hunter's benefit. But, you know, if there was a more perfect world where Joe Biden didn't have this son with addiction issues, 
Uh, that, so that's how perfect the world would be. And we could have fair people looking at it. I would welcome all the answers as to why Hunter Biden said on a text message, you know, I'd be giving half my money to pop. I bet it's a decent answer, but we haven't gotten that answer yet. That said, I, yeah. I, I worry about. I don't worry about this. I do think McCarthy knows this could be a really stupid mistake. And and the the only thing that I've heard is basically in terms of evidence is that there's an IRS. There are a couple of IRS whistleblowers who testified that the IRS slow walked the investigation of Hunter Biden because they they you know um, because he's the son of the president and that slow walking kind of ran out the statute of limitations on certain charges. So it sort of like lessened what could happen to Hunter. Um, yeah, a federal and, prosecutor told me that they never let the statute of limitations run out. That is just either they decide to prosecute or not. So that's a little unusual. OK, so then there's that. And then, but, and, and then the other thing that I guess some a business associate of Hunter Biden's said that Biden stopped by a business dinner and said hi. Um, and I, And again, I think like do i love that biden had a, a probably you know probably did stop by a business dinner and said hi to his son or whatever i don't love that that kind of thing happens what i do think is though that that probably has happened with like every child of a president since the beginning of time you know what i mean like i just don't think we there's a um, there's formal legality Right. And being a lobbyist here, the problem is totally fucking legal. Right. That's kind of yeah. the, the problem. Is that is that what is that what his job was a legal job and being the son of the president is also legal. Right. So then both of those things, they exist. They occur. We don't have rules about that. And so that's really the problem. It makes us feel icky, but there's nothing like technically wrong with it. It is icky. Right. But it's, un you know, unfortunately, that's just like the way it is. It's legal. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel I totally agree with everything Mike said. And I also feel like what has base what is basically happening here is for months, if not years, um, there has been uh, like a sort of people there on the right, there has been a sort of like fever dream about the appearance of wrongdoing around Hunter Biden. And there have been yeah. all different ways that this has manifested it's been the laptop it's been barisma it's been you know there there are various different iterations and listen the guy clearly like he's got some serious issues like i'm not trying to say that like like mike said, he's an upstanding you know, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah right okay but so like there has been this like pervasive appearance of wrongdoing or or theoretical appearance of wrongdoing that they've that they've like really been trying hard to breathe real life into and what this impeachment inquiry allows them to do is to subpoena documents that could then potentially depending on what they find allow them to they might maybe they do find real evidence or maybe they just subpoena a lot of stuff and then they find like it, it allows them to actually dig and get you know bank records and stuff like that which is probably not great news um for anybody, you know? Um, so I think that that's, uh, you know, if, if, if you are, I think Mike is right that it, it is also very likely to backfire, but also, you know, the other side of this is that it's also very likely to sort of keep Hunter Biden and Biden's impeachment in the news. And one thing that I've learned on, on over reporting on this on sort of the way Americans think about politics for many years now is that there doesn't have to be evidence for it to convince voters. Right. They, you know, so you can be a very clear thinking, hard headed person and know that there is no real evidence of wrongdoing by the president in this matter. And yet the right wing media machine is able to construct the appear the appearance of wrongdoing around almost anything. So that's the danger here. But to their people, I think, to the people who are already plugged into the right wing media machine, I think that there, there are certain scandals that people believe that have 
absolutely nothing to them and really are just fever dreams. And there are certain scandals like maybe this, this is a scandal when it comes to Hunter and his behavior. Is it a scandal when it comes to Joe? I mean, in a sentence, here's the thing that's not good. Joe Biden was in charge of rooting out corruption in Ukraine. At the same time, his son was working for a corrupt company at Ukraine. That's a fact. And that's not good. However, that's not good. And I would say Joe Biden did not act with the utmost of ethics in that position. However, 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 the links between Hunter giving anything to his dad or his dad doing anything that helped Hunter. I mean, his dad, I guess, could have thrown his body in front of Hunter Biden and said, you will not take this job. He chose not to do it. His dad called Hunter. He calls Hunter every day. And some of those calls occurred when he was with business associates. But yeah, so there are things of this that isn't like, Hillary Clinton drinks yeah. the blood of babies, right? right. There's a little <laughs> right. more right. to it than that. But if they really do, if they subpoena records, and they'll spin records into, they'll spin whatever they find, even if it's nothing, into maybe something if you want to believe. But if it really is nothing, I do think this will redound to their detriment. Okay, but Mike, I actually want to bounce off something you just said, which is that I actually think Hillary Clinton is a really good example here because she's also somebody where... That she was constantly under investigation, Libya, like there were all kinds of things that she was under investigation for. And most of those things came up with buckus when Mm -hmm. it was when it when it was sort of actually rubber meets the road, evidence of real wrongdoing, like nothing. But the constant drumbeat of scandal, scandal, liar, liar, her emails, Libya, whatever, you know, uh, like it has a it has a it has an effect on people. You know, it, it, it makes people think, oh, both sides are bad. Both sides are lying. Both sides. Right. It like attaches to her. What it did with her specifically, I think is it attached to her, this kind of like, she's a manipulative, bad person thing, even though there was no like real, it's like, and then you would say, but why? And then people couldn't specifically relay, but it's just like it, it, the drumbeat had done its job. That's, I mean, um, that's a good example, but of course, sexism and Hillary's lack of, of skill, course. she would say yeah. lack of skill as a politician and compare it to Barack Obama. There was no, I mean, they tried to just this last week, Tucker Carlson was interviewing uh, a, a, a guy who claims to have had an affair with Bar- Anyway, I don't want to, I definitely don't want to get into it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't successfully try that right. with Obama. And they didn't do that with Joe Biden in his, in the last On election. his own, yeah. Because, no, yeah. This, because the actual information hadn't come to light. So now it does seem to be somewhat correlative, not perfectly correlative and not I- exactly fairly expressed by the most feverish um, corners of the Jim Jordan verse. But it seems at least a little bit correlative with stuff that she's done wrong or he's done wrong. Like Hillary Clinton didn't do anything wrong when it came to say Uranium One, that was a bullshit scandal. But when it came to using the Clinton Foundation to raise money and also turn around to have some actual power, it's acceptable. It's the way job the job is done, but it's also a little swampy. So they're right. worth it, something. The, right. the email server, she would admit, was it a high crime? Yeah, it's not great. Should it have been prosecuted? Comey told us no, but it doesn't seem like the best uh, practices, just like this Biden thing with Ukraine is certainly not the best practices. Right. right. But, 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 and I, and I, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, well, I we do have to wrap up there. You would, you have a final, a quick final. Um, Yeah. All I was going to say is to that exact point, like that is the type of thing that could come up here though. You know, some little thing that you're right is not a high crime and misdemeanor, but could could within the context of the drumbeat of alleged wrongdoing could still kind of you know have a little bit more of an impact than we think all right folks let me know what where are you on this biden impeachment situation pat like i'm more curious about even if it's crossed your um radar in a meaningful way because i know it, it feels sort of like it to me it just feels like it's been just like fringe news or like trying to make it into the mainstream news for so long and like now it's having a moment or whatever um i don't know i'm so curious hit me up now let's get into topic number three so in the last month we've seen a spate of articles about aging countries and a times piece i read um it said that by 2034 there will be more americans 
uh, sorry, New York Times piece, not Time Magazine. Just to be clear here, we're we're with a Times uh, correspondent, a Time Magazine correspondent. Um, but it said by 2034, there'll be more Americans past retirement age than there are children. Um, and we've never thought of America this way, but America's really old, uh, and it's, and it's getting older. I mean, here's some more interesting statistics. There's an average of 10,000 boomers who turn 65 every day. So the pressure is mounting because we, all of our social services are not geared towards this, uh, volume of senior citizens. So I guess uh, my first question is, um, what what do you think are the consequences of a kind of aging society? I think we have to raise the retirement age, first of all. <laughs> well, all of these stats are based on the idea that 65 is old, but it's not. Those guys are still watching Marvel movies and wearing board shorts. Yes, right, right. 65 that... does not feel old, definitely old. anymore. It does yeah. not. Remember our, you know, forefathers 65 and what that meant. And then we think of the current 65. I don't know. Maybe it's that the most powerful people in the country are in their 80s or about to be that 65 is seeming particularly spry. Um, I, do, <laughs> I do think, though, in terms of funding our obligations, it is better to have fewer people needing the funding on the retirement end and more people paying into the funding. Absolutely true. But then if you look at societies with huge youth cohorts, like many of the countries in the Middle East, that is a bad formula for success. So I don't know, you know, you hear about the gerontocracies of Western Europe, you hear about the young countries of Africa and the Middle East. Basically, demographers have convinced us that there is no good age cohort that any country should aspire to. And, you know, China has the one child policy and now they seem to regret it. India has passed them in terms of population. Is there ever a good answer for how old a country should be? I think maybe the best answer answer is just redefine youth upwards. But also, I mean, I think the answer to the question is like, what is the best mix? The best mix is that there's more young people who can there's enough young people who can pay for the aging of the old people. Like, I think yeah. it comes down to just that math problem. And the pro and like when you look at a place like Japan, so like Japan is the oldest of all of the Western economies. Um, and they have had to uh, increase the retirement age. Much older people are now working. They've had to add rest areas in like their job sites or whatever, ramps and handrails, because they're just literally having old people do labor intensive jobs. And they're just expecting that like they'll do it and they'll just need a little bit more rest. So they'll probably also be less productive doing those jobs. <laughs> um, they've had 450 schools close every year. Um, because there's just not enough kids to fill those schools. So imagine the shuttering of schools it feels particularly depressing to me. Um, they just, it's, 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 it's just, it's a, it's a money problem, you know, and it, and it's a, and it's a workforce problem because we need young people to take care of the old people just literally with, with labor. But it's also, you know, I also, I think that this is interesting in terms of what it says about the social and economic conditions that led to this generation gap, right? Because these boomers who are, you know, 10,000 of them are turning 65 every day, they were part of the baby boom, right? So like, what were the conditions that allowed their parents to have so many kids? Yeah. Uh, government subsidized higher education through the GI Bill. Um, you could buy a house for like $30,000. Um, there were really strong unions that, you know, made it so that, um, a single man, sorry, so, so that a man working, uh, a job at a factory could make enough money to support a family of four very easily and also have a car and go to Disney world and take his kids out to dinner. Um, and then now, so, so those were the, that, those were the conditions in which this, very old generation of boomers was born. And the reason that there isn't a huge cohort of younger people coming up behind them to, uh, you know, age into these jobs, to grow the economy, to make more money to support them is because the conditions that allowed their parents to have four, five, six kids have radically changed. And I'm seeing this right now, frankly, there was, um, you know, I'm 34. I have a, 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 
a almost two year old. And I'm like one of the only people that I know who has a kid, which yeah. is, yeah. Un- which is unusual. Cause I'm, I'm 34. I have a college education. I'm what married. city well, do like, you live? Where, where do you live? I, I live in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's a little, that might be a little young for Brooklyn, but <laughs> yeah, you're like a child. You're like, you're, yeah, you're basically, like, you had like a teenage pregnancy by, yeah, by, by New York I, city standards. Exactly. I, I always say I'm like a Brooklyn teen mom, but yeah. like, but, but actually that is a huge so part normal. of this question yeah. though, is that like, you know, my grandmother, the mother, you know, who my, my grandmother is of the generation who had the baby boomers, right? Cause my parents are baby boomers. My grandmother uh, had her first kid at 19, her second kid at 23, her third kid at like 27 or whatever. By the time she was my age, she had a middle schooler, right? So that, so, but the reason that she was able to do that is that social and economic conditions were such that she and my grandfather felt like in their early twenties, they could support a family and nobody feels like that anymore. So it's like, Mm -hmm. so that's why there aren't, you know, the reason that I'm one of the only people my age who has a kid is not because there's anything special about me. It's because my generation has been like totally screwed by these by these social and economic conditions and you can't get a house and you can't get a get health insurance and everyone has student debt. I, that's why. I don't I don't disagree with that assessment, but I would also add there's a huge other component, which is women's rights, which like our of grandmothers course. didn't have. And uh, I would say a culture of supporting women in the workforce that they didn't have and a cultural norm, which which suggested that women's greatest role was to like pump out babies. Right. And so there so there was all that those things that gave rise to it. And the other interesting thing about the baby boom it was unusual. Like they call it the baby boomer generation because it was a sudden population increase, the likes of which they had never seen before. So we sort of forget like the baby boom is also a little bit what fucked us. Cause if we had gone on a normal path, like we wouldn't have the population that we, we wouldn't have such a large population of baby boomers uh, we, just general population numbers would be lower. The boom meant that we had to build a ton more schools that are now shuttering, right? In Japan, the boom meant, yeah. you know, that like there, there's this imbalance. So the the boom itself is a problem um, that has, you know, that's, that's now having knock-on effects for the globe. Um, Mike, my question to you is about migration. So there's con- countries like China. I mean, China is interestingly fucked because it lifted. And by the way, you were saying conditions. Oh, this is a point I want to make about conditions to have a kid, <laughs> that they were be- be- better for our grandmother's age. Or that things were cheaper. It was easier. Here's what's interesting. China lifted the one child policy in 2016. They wanted the ki- their citizens to have um, up to three children. And they started enticing them with cash incentives, discounted real estate, extended maternity leave, all of that. And none of that was successful. So so there's there you go with a little bit of help and creating the conditions to make people want to have more kids. When you say Um, China is fucked, that's precisely wrong. (laughs) Sorry, that's 180 degrees wrong. from what. Okay. Sorry. No, I mean, literally in terms of uh, procreation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, if they were fucking, we wouldn't be in this situation. The facts are that the economy is greatly correlated with birth rates. And so, Charlotte, you were talking about how you're one of the few people in your neighborhood or maybe in your field or graduated from college, your college friends, maybe high school friends who have a kid. But if you look at women without a college degree, average age of first birth, about 24, women with a college degree, about 31. So would you advise people not to have a college degree? But no, it's no, a bif- not. Yeah. Right. So it's but it's a bifurcation of America. You get a college degree, you establish yourself in your career, you put off for logical economic reasons having a baby. And then, you know, about in the 90s, you put it off until your 20s and then things were fine and maybe a house was or a decent middle class, upper middle class life was within reach. Now it's not. So the birth rates in the 90s were increased from 
the decade before when economic times weren't as good and the birth rates in the last 10 years have decreased because of the Great Recession and economic times. Um, but also it's greatly different depending on where you are. There's New York, San Francisco, some zip codes of Brooklyn, lowest ages of first birth, whereas you look at like the Mississippi Delta, but also all throughout the Midwest and all in Texas, very low, comparatively low age for mothers. And that also is exactly if you put a map of housing costs on top of birth rates, you would see that it was exactly. almost the same map. Yes, so exactly. A, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on. It's not just generationally. It's our, it's just how college education and um, our social milieu have totally dovetailed. So, you know, people, a college graduate isn't just how much education you have. It's what kind of person you are and what kind of life choices you make. And it's also um, the affordability is not, it's true in general that things are less affordable, but if you move or live a different kind of lifestyle, maybe a lesser lifestyle, then things become more affordable. Americans are moving so much less than they used to. All these cross trends going on, and I can't even begin to price China into it. I don't know. I, and, I yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, I wanted and I wanted to to bring it back to migration for a quick second here to to wrap it up and get your thoughts on migration. The interesting thing, and just to like. I don't know. This is a the, to give us a little pat on the back here in America. Um, we actually don't have a, as big a problem with replacing our population because we do have migration. Now, I understand that we are shitty in so many aspects of immigration and the refugee crisis and all of that. Now that stipulated, we are still, um, you know, doing so much better with replacing our population with migration and accepting migration. And we are, in fact, a country of migrants, right? So it's it's not unusual for us to do that. By contrast, in Japan, only um, uh, two percent of the population is immigrants. In India, 0.3 percent, and China has the lowest, a 0.1 percent. It's almost impossible for a foreigner to get Chinese citizenship. So you you know you think of a country like that. In, in Germany, by contrast, 17% of the people in Germany were foreign born in uh, 2021. So, so different countries are having different reactions. And also like xenophobia plays into the, po the public policies that they're making, what role, uh, it, it sort of makes me, you know, it, it heartens me that we have already a, a some sort of a acceptance that immigrants come here and they not only replace our population and our tax base, um, you know, but they help with just the replace our population replacement population uh, issue. So, uh, what did you what do you think of um, migration as a solution in the future? But it seems less a policy and more a happenstance. I mean, Canada does migration correctly. Trudeau says we have a right. goal of half a million migrants, and they pull in all these people and, you know, Canada's older than we are, but our, isn't faced with the replacement problem because their population is growing by conscious choice from their migration policy. Of course, Canada shares a Southern border with the United States and the United States shares a Southern border with Mexico. That fact alone, and I'm not even kidding how cold it is in Canada, <laughs> dissuades a lot of people from going there. Yep. You know, so I, I can't magically wish uh, Canada's migration policies on us. We're different countries geographically, but that's the way to do it, I think. All right, folks, Um, let me know. <laughs> what, do you feel the graying of America? Um, And what do you think about it? Hit me up. All right, that is the end of the show. I'm so excited that you were both on. What a phenomenal conversation. Um, I feel so great having spoken to both of you and I would love for the people of Fake the Nation to be able to follow you and all of the wonderful things that you do. Charlotte, where do they do that? Um, you can listen to Time's Person of the Week podcast and you can also follow me on Twitter at, at Charlotte Alter. Uh, guys, absolutely be, you should be subscribing to the Time person of the week podcast uh we all know the person of the year cover and this promises to be um uh, more of that feeling um i love i actually love the titillation the feeling the, the surprise the you know the you know like who who is the time person of the year oh my god so um i imagine having that same feeling every week with the pod so what a what a wonderful conceit uh, mike pesca where do they find you 
Well, I have the GIST podcast. I have a Substack called Pesca Profundities, and uh, I I tweet or X at Pesca Me P E S C A M I. And I don't want to steal any of Thor- Charlotte's thunder, but I was the time person of the year <laughs> in 2007. This is a visual. I am holding up the actual Time Magazine cover with a piece of uh, tin foil on it that tried to convince us all in 2006, I guess we were the time person of the year. But I, my, I look I look to this and I get affirmation from it, Charlie. I cannot <laughs> believe that you have that. I, I know, can't and believe I, that it's physically there. And I can't believe you had it uh, on hand. Like yeah. it was within, he didn't get up and leave the room or anything like no. that. He just like had it. It was like, it was there ready for this moment. It's like he knew this moment was gonna happen. Yeah. Look at some um, of these. Some I'm leafing through some of the ads. It looks like this upstart company may, named PayPal might be going someplace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, <laughs> folks. You know where to find me and all the things I do. But I want to let everybody know that it, theoretically, I have fully updated my website for the fall. I think so. You will find all of my dates in the fall, and I want to alert. Boston area listeners, I'm going to be on the MIT campus doing a free show on September 22nd. The information is on my website, againforsaw.com. Um, click on the events tab and you can see all the information on how to get tickets. Um, and it's, oh, but here's the wild thing is it's free. So uh, if you are in the Boston area in Cambridge, come out to MIT on September 22nd. I will be doing an entire hour of the case for American exceptionalism by a lady Muzz, um, my hour of stand-up comedy uh, at MIT. I would love to see you there. We're also doing a live podcast taping um, of the reason we're all still here podcast um, at the green space. And it's going to be really fun. And it's this crazy, we're going to be looking at Dr. Strange love um, and how it is, how it affected, <laughs> how it is um, both a documentary and how it has affected so many things um, um, since since it came out, um, so I'll, I'll I'll let you know more about that. That'll be in, on October third, um, and I have I'm going to be doing wait wait don't tell me dates September 27th in San Diego, um, the wait wait don't tell me stand up tour, um, and September 29th in San Francisco. Um, so you can p- see me doing stand up in those cities. I also have uh, other dates coming up, um, you know, in in DC and Philadelphia. So um, so stay tuned for those dates, but they should all now be on my website, um, which I know has been a problem for myself. Um, and I would like to make, uh, and I would love to thank everyone who makes the show a possibility. That's our wonderful producer, Andrew McGuire. Thanks to Gabby Alter for our fantastic theme music. Thanks to everyone at HeadGum for making the show a possibility. If you, if you have any thoughts you want to send to us, please email us at Nagin Fars- No. Don't email us at Nagin Farsad at anything because that's not a real email address. Email us at fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, again, that's fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and let us know what you think. Also, don't forget to subscribe at patreon.com slash Nagin Farsad where you get really fun bonus episodes of the show, um, among other goodies. Fake the na- uh, Again, that's patreon.com. Oh my God, I have so many verbal <laughs> like problems today. And I don't, no, I don't know why. I don't know why. What happened? Did I not sleep? It's fucking fall. It's fucking it's fall. fall. That's why. It's fall. Um, uh, patreon.com slash Nagin Farsad. And um, otherwise, we will be back in your earballs next week. <laughs> <laughs>